Hey guys, JB here from Alpwolf Consulting. Coming to you today with another awesome Stone Daz adventure. Uh, and it's basically I'm out in the Byfield National Park in the Stony Creek state, like forestry around Stony Creek. And it's absolutely beautiful out here today. And I love it, like getting out to this part is because there's the mountains all around, but also there's these beautiful open pine forests that I'm in now, and it's like half bushland, half pine forest. So it's absolutely like what I reckon is beautiful because it doesn't feel as enclosed as when you go in the bushland. In this episode today, um, what I'm going to talk about are some, some topics that really excite me. Um, and it's, it's basically understanding, you know, self-validation, self-belief, um, self-confidence and self-worth. These are the four aspects that make up who I am, the, the ideal of self. So... For example, you know, self-validation is the practice. Oh, I'll wait for this wind. So, self-validation is the practice of understanding how to validate what is my own thought and belief, but also how do I validate my opinion and my point of view within me, for me? Because we're taught growing up that we should always seek to validate our opinions externally to us. So, for example, if I want to feel good at something, I should look to my external environment for my results to base my judgment on it, not how I feel while I do it and how I feel about what I've accomplished while doing it. So self-validation is the fundamental groundwork of understanding well how do do we natural like like how do we you know organically validate or how have we been conditioned to seek validation and it's sort of like well how do we reprogram that so that we can validate everything internally so that i don't need results to feel good about myself about <coughs> something i'm doing sorry but We've got to understand that is the, the base sort of foundation. So while self-validation in on itself is crucial to understanding who am I, because we first have to understand well, what is authentically me and what is um, you know, being conditioned into me by society or what is a persona or a mask that I've created that I'm wearing. And, you know, the next step from there is understanding self-belief. Because it's great for us to validate our opinion and validate our thoughts and beliefs, but if every time we get self-doubt, we feed that, you know, we fuel that fire and we feed that demon, you know, what we're going to do is we're always going to spiral out of control. So no matter what work we do in terms of, you know, understanding what is authentically me, what is not authentically me, what is for me, what is not for me, what do I want to invest in, what don't I want to invest in. Okay, and then the next step from there 
is understanding, well, how does self-belief work? Because self-belief is, it's the opposite of self-doubt. Just like self-validation is the opposite of, you know, seeking external validation. Sick. So, you know, we've got to understand that in every moment while I'm alive, in every, you know, choice that I'm given, I get to choose, you know, you know, when I'm given information, do I feel self-doubt or do I feel self-empowerment or self-belief? You know, do I, do I choose to believe I can do something or do I choose to fuel, fuel the self-doubt of, oh, maybe this isn't for me, maybe this won't work for me. What if this, what if that? So, like, we've really got to understand when we say, you know, this is what I think and believe, we have to be able to back it up with with the self-belief. I thought I heard a car. With the self-belief to be able to trust in ourselves. Because that's what self-belief is. Is just choosing to trust that you can do it. So every time you get a negative thought, we just reprogram that negative thought into a new positive belief. So how we do this is very, very simple and it's very easy, but like, let's say I, I'm, I want to lose weight and let's say I decide that, you know, I'm going to go to the gym four days a week and I'm going to eat uh, on a set diet. And then let's say two weeks in, you know, I'm not seeing the immediate results that I'd hoped for or that I'd wanted or desired. So then self-doubt starts to come in, in the form of, well, you know, you're putting in all this effort, is it even gonna go anywhere? So what we gotta understand is when that thought comes, we gotta, and it's really hard at the beginning because these are subconscious thoughts, so these aren't conscious thoughts. So we just get this, and, and how it comes across, well, it will be a feeling of, I don't know if this will work. What if this doesn't work? What if, you know, or it might be, you know, on the other side where we're using pleasure. So, you know, like, oh, it's not going to be that bad if I, you know, eat greasy food today. You know, it's not going to be that bad if I miss a meal. You know, I can do this and that. Where we start to sort of negotiate with ourselves on, on the boundaries we've set within ourselves. So, we've got to understand that self-belief is just choosing to stand for the boundaries that you've set or, or the beliefs that you hold. So for example, if you believe that you can do anything that you set your mind to, and so long as you just keep persisting, you will achieve your goal, then if every time you start to get hesitation or self-doubt, you catch that, okay, no matter what, what stage it's at, in the early stages when you're learning this, okay, this is me just talking from my experience, but in the early stages when I, I learn this for a new sort of like area in my life or a new challenge, like it's hard for me to notice those, those points where I'm negotiating with myself or where I'm talking myself down. So this works for everything in life with limiting beliefs. We've got to first sort of become hyper aware to something is happening. So if I'm not achieving the results that I want or achieving the goal or being able to follow the path to the goal that I've set out, something is wrong. So what we have to do, and this is what I had to do, is I had to go quiet and become hyper aware of everything that I was feeling. So I had to analyze everything so that I could spot the spikes or the variations, you know, where, you know, so I could, I could see the narrative in the context of, you know, when I'm replaying my day and I catch myself creating a story, you know, because we all write narratives in our head about everything that happens to us and the meaning and all of that. When I catch myself writing a negative narrative in when I'm analyzing, I have to go through 
and then set, you know, um, flags so that every time I, I, I do that in the future, I can pull myself up. And it's sort of you get better at catching yourself. And then what happens is, is because you catch yourself and then you shift the behavior back to what it needs to be, you're training your subconscious that, hey, every time you veer off course, when I catch you, we're getting back on course. So your subconscious will sort of get into the habit of, of just staying on course. And it's funny because I understood this, uh, this really well um, when I was observing child raising and, and, and child rearing. Because you think about it, with a child, you want to catch them in the bad behavior or identify the behavior that's causing them to be, you know, naughty or something like that or, you know, the root cause. And then you want to start to catch them and sort of reprogram their behavior by saying, hey, don't do that, do this. So, you know, and we understand that, hey, for a child, and this is what a lot of people I've noticed don't understand when you're teaching other people especially when you're setting boundaries, is it's not a once off and it's done. Like it's not a, I tell you once and then it's in your brain. Because what we've got to understand is the level of care someone has for the relationship will determine, you know, how serious they take, um, you know, anything you're saying. So it's a really good, indicator especially in personal relationships if someone isn't treating you how you want to be treated and you tell them this is how I want to be treated okay and they don't do that that is them saying like like there are other things I care more about than you you're a low priority on my list now this isn't a bad thing because what we're able to do is we're able to understand intentions and motives. So we, we know their intentions are, you know, they don't value this connection or this relationship. So we shouldn't. And the funny thing is, and this is a realization I had um, quite recently, and it's that I always had a difficulty because if I like you, I cared about you a lot. And what I had to teach myself and learn was there's a separation between liking and caring. So I can, and, and it goes across every relationship, family, friends, you know, intimate relationships, work relationships. Like I can really, really like my job, but if you talk to me disrespectfully, I'm going to tell you to go get fucked and walk off. So there has to be a separation between the care. Because the problem is, is if I care more than you care, it's uneven because you can manipulate my behavior by, you know, limiting or um, taking your presence away. So the thing I had to realize, especially in personal relationships and intimate relationships for me, was there's a separation between caring and liking. So I can like you and think you're the coolest person, but that doesn't mean I give a fuck about you. You've got to earn me caring, just like I've got to earn you caring through the action. So it's not that, you know, if I say I'm in a relationship with someone, that, you know, job done, you can sort of, you know, be on perpetual smoko. No, it's a constant work. So we've got to understand this in all relationships, okay? We're, we're having to constantly remind people why they should care for us by, you know, thinking about them, caring about them, giving them value, you know, looking out for them, you know, doing all those things. And that's a big thing in relationships is it's not, you know, we, we agree to be in a relationship and then that's that. No, it's you work every day at it and in every moment you have to make conscious decisions in favor of it you know and if you don't it'll degrade because if one person is invested and the other person isn't what will happen is it becomes unbalanced and then resentment starts to be grown 
because of lack of reciprocation or reciprocity. So we got to understand this in the context that when we're trying to understand ourselves, okay, we, we also will understand others. So because if I don't care for someone and I don't value, you know, their time, I'm going to act in specific ways. So if someone acts in those ways towards me, I'm able to realize, well, hey, you actually don't care about me. You know, you're, you're in this um, with no care. So I have to limit my care. So it's a very, very important thing because it translates through to, this is how we have to treat people's opinions. Everyone's got the right to an opinion, okay? And everyone's opinion's valid to them. But the thing is, is it doesn't have to be valid to you. So being able to um, learn how to devalue opinions that aren't based, you know, in logic or fact, that are, that are just based in, you know, bias, and, and how to, how to, how to sift through and decipher the valuable information that people are sharing. Because when we share opinions, we're sharing knowledge, experience. The thing is, is the unvaluable opinions are when people talk about things they haven't personally experienced or they don't know much on the topic. Okay? These are called posers. Because they don't care to put the effort in to know it, they think they know it, and they'll tell you, you should learn about it, but they won't put the effort in to learn it. So why listen to anything? Because they don't give a fuck. So that's the funny thing, is in everything in life, especially in interpersonal connections and, you know, understanding emotional intelligence, we have to understand how we connect to each other. So a very key thing that we connect to each other is through experience and, and through communication. But communication isn't always, um, like it's only like 10 to maybe 20% the words we say, okay? So we gotta understand there's a lot more, especially in a transference um, where you're in a conversation in person, because you gotta understand on the subconscious level, we're transferring information and data that we have. So that's why you'll, you'll understand that sometimes it's really hard to understand someone explain a textbook to you only, only audio, like only over audio. Because what happens is, is there's a lot of information that's missed out. Whereas when we, when we have speech, we're able to inflect different forms of meaning. But the other thing is, and emotion through tonality, but the other thing is, is when we're in person, we actually transfer memory and things like that. And, you know, um, what's his name? Oh, I can't think of it. Ah. <sighs> Uh, I can't think of his name, but he, he studied in it. Like if you look into metaphysics, uh, well, well you can look into metaphysics, but if you look into like spirituality and then you look into advanced forms of uh, science on consciousness, um, oh, his name is just at the tip of my tongue, but I can't get it out. But basically what happens is, is we, we, we transfer thought we project thought out of our minds and we can receive thought. And this, over the next 10 years, this, this science will become mainstream. This understanding. It's sort of like when you talk to someone and you're with someone and you just get them. Or you have that instant click where, you know, you're just on the same wavelength. Okay? So we got to understand these are alignments of different energetic fields 
These are different um, styles of communication, um, layers of psychology. It's, it's everything encompassed. It's sort of like having the holistic view towards understanding communication because there's so many layers of communication. So, you know, if, if we can understand this, it really helps us in understanding, well, you know, if everyone is struggling with multiple different problems and different layers of problems and dimensions of problems, okay, when I'm feeling self-doubt or when I'm feeling, you know, self-judgment, when I'm feeling like I need to justify who I am or my value, well, I know that they're all illogical um, fears that have been shaped through, you know, society and upbringing and culture and things like that. So what we have to do is every time I, I feel that, I need to focus on having a conscious awareness to when I feel that, okay, now I understand what it means, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to reprogram a new belief. And then, you know, we get better at it. Now, the next stage from self-belief is understanding self-confidence. Now, to understand confidence, we have to actually truly understand what confidence means. So many people... I call them posers, will tell you that confidence is asserting yourself. Confidence is something you can fake. Confidence is, you know, arrogance. It's being brash. It's flashy. It's making people envious of you and jealous of you. That's all bullshit. The simple form of confidence is certainty of outcome. Okay? If I tell you that a process I've created will get you this outcome with 100% certainty, I'm, and, and it actually does, and I believe that it does, okay, I'm able to talk with certainty. The certainty that if you do this, it will happen. Like, by all means, don't do it, but you will get the results if you do it. That's different to me trying to pose that I am someone who, you know, sort of people say, like, be the lion, puff out your chest, sort of, you know, standing on the rock trying to pose like everything should be intimidated by me. It's like, no, you should be intimidated by me because I'm competent and capable and willing to do whatever it takes. That's why you should be worried, not, not because I'm someone who's higher or above people, or in essence better, it's, nah. See, that's the thing. Certainty of outcome only comes from thousands upon thousands of hours of dedicated, like, work towards mastery. Confidence only comes by doing something a thousand times because we understand every variable. So when things happen, we're, we're able to remain calm because we've experienced this before. So it's really funny because, you know, they portray this a lot in war movies and, you know, about ineffective commanders that, you know, prior to going into combat are all you know, chest out, and they're this, they're that, they're aggressive, and then what happens is, is they see true, you know, true violence and true evil, and they cower, and they become like, like betas, like they, they, they cease to want to fight, they lose their aggression, and the reason is, is because their confidence is not based in a certainty of outcome, whereas you have stories of other commanders who dedicated, you know, their time throughout training in preparation to becoming the most competent and capable. And even under the worst circumstances, the 
you know, the most difficult situation, they were able to remain calm, cool and collected. And in, in many cases, were able to save like countless thousands of people, you know, thousands of soldiers' lives by not, by not reacting, but by remaining in control and being proactive. So that's one of the keys that happens to us in every stressful situation is when we become off balanced, all this is, is we are becoming reactionary. So when we become reactionary, that's when fear sets in and we have to sort of hands up and we're, we're looking and defending for blows. Whereas in proactive, we're looking and analyzing for like where to strike, where is the opportunity? You know, we've got a clear, open view of what's happening when we're proactive because we're actively looking around. When we're reactive, we're dead focused and tunnel vision on that one threat or that one challenge. So we got to understand that in life, we should always seek to remain proactive regardless of what happens in life, regardless of what comes at you, regardless of the situation, how do I um, put this in control? Whoops, that's my bad, one sec. Sorry. But yeah, so basically, we always want to remain proactive to how am I like like how how do I remain on the on the front foot so when I feel the energy shift and I feel an attack coming how do I step and blow so you know it's it's very important but this comes across on everything so we got to understand for anything, you can do everything. So everything works, everything fails. Okay, so, you know, understanding this knowledge, I'm able to transfer it to, you know, emotional engagements where I'm in an emotional confrontations, where how do I stay proactive to if someone's trying to get me off balance or make me emotionally unstable, how can I be one step ahead of them so I can defuse that situation prior to it, you know, them utilizing it or, or prior to it becoming like its fullest expression or reaching its, its apex or its, its climax. Because what we wanna do is if we're able to defuse a fight when someone's starting to get pissed off, you know, it's easier to defuse a fight while someone's starting to get angry. You know, once they're angry, it's very difficult to defuse it. So across everything in life, always look to see if there's a potential for conflict. Okay, how could I avoid that conflict before it even happens or have a plan to neutralize that? So, for example, a really good plan to have is to avoid conflict. If people get aggressive, just walk away. Just like, that's what I mean. It's easier to, to like, it's far easier to walk away when someone's getting pissed off than it is to walk away when they're already angry. Because when they're already angry, they'll try and attack you from behind. When they're just getting pissed off, like they'll yell out bullshit, but if you just keep walking off and don't engage, like it, they're not gonna come and attack you because you've now put distance between the attack. So like distance creates uncertainty. So distance, so if I can create uncertainty in an engagement, I can, I can lower the probability of that engagement happening. That's another way to look at it. So if I want that engagement to happen, so let's say we were using it, you know, for the positive benefits. Well, if I can clear up uncertainty, the likelihood of an engagement going ahead increases. So for example, I'll give you an example in sales. If I can, 
like if I can lower the uncertainty in the offer that I present to you to where the likelihood that you make money is very high and the risk to you not making money is quite low because I guarantee it and take on all the risk and I have you know trojan uh, like like a load of you know proof of concept and, and reviews well then I'm able to lower the uncertainty to a point where the majority of people will say yes and go ahead with it so if we understand this <laughs> you know this is how we build self-confidence by understanding you know situations and how to deal with situations and, 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 and building that trust that even in uncertainty if I want to feel you know if I want to proceed through a challenge that has you know that's un, you know through a challenge well I want to minimize the uncertainty if I want to diffuse a situation or not have something progress forward all I have to do is increase the um, the like the the variabilities like increase the uncertainty to a point where it's too uncomfortable the person or you know the thing doesn't want to progress forward because you've got to understand if we if we take that same scenario with the fight okay if you're getting angry at me and you're like oh i'm gonna punch you soon and i walk away and don't say anything to you and don't try and provoke you don't say anything smart and i just walk away and keep walking like i'm increasing the amount of variables that that you have to now consider to attack me so potentially there might be police driving potentially there might be police walking on the street you know, potentially there might be someone who sees it that wants to join in. Like, there, there's all these added things. Potentially there's a group walking up and things like that. Like, so we just got to understand, if I, if I don't, you know, personally feel safe in a situation, well then I should, I should try to, you know, create as much uncertainty in that situation. So, for example... To, to put this in perspective, if, if it's late night and let's say I'm in the city and I'm walking down the street and I start to notice someone following me and I start to feel off. Now it doesn't mean that that person's following me or anything, but if I start to feel off, well, now let's try and get some uncertainty into that. So we move across the street. You know, we take all these different random actions to try and, you know, like, like, Basically, what it does is it proves to us, hey, for no shadow of a doubt, this person is following me. Because the likelihood that they would take every turn or do everything like that, you know, is quite high. So, what we're able to do is we're able to now focus on how do I involve as many variables as possible. So, for example, if I was walking down, Maybe there's a group of people and you stop to talk to them, ask them a question. Like you ask them for directions and just say, hey, this dude's following me. You mind, you know, back him out while I confront him? Now, don't get me wrong. Situational awareness. Understand your environment and where you are. Because the potential is, is if you're in a position of vulnerability and you seek protection from others, if those others are predatory in nature, they will seek to capitalize on your, um, like, on, on your vulnerability. So, a key thing to remember, one second. And this is especially true for men, and, and mostly men. But it does work for women if you're able to do it. But basically for men, you don't have that option. I don't have that option. We don't have that option. If you feel someone coming behind you and following you, we don't ask for help. The, there's two ways that scenario plays out. 
One is you try to avoid it and you try to distance yourself from it. Um, if, they, if they match speed or even try to catch you, that, that engages option two and that's the only option that makes sense. You turn, regardless of if they have a weapon, and you charge them and you attack them. The key to this is if someone's being predatory towards you, you must attack them. Because like, you know, you know, big cats and fucking this and that, I don't know if I'd do it with a crocodile, but you can do it with crocodiles. If you charge an animal, you can intimidate it. A predator isn't ready for a fight. A predator is looking to take advantage of vulnerability. So if you do not show vulnerability and you show maximum aggression, most predators will run. And that's a key thing. So, you know, in that scenario, in life, you have to put the effort in as a man, just like I have to put the effort in, to be vicious and violent and capable so that you can have certainty of outcome in your ability to defend yourself. Because for men, that's where a lot of self-confidence comes from. Because I cannot be self-confident and confident in you know, certainty of outcome for me if every other man is gonna victimize me, okay? And then you become one of those betas that are the bitch to everyone. And no one wants to be like that. So the thing is, is like, and in my life, like I don't experience violence on a, like these days, I don't experience violence because people, people don't like, if I'm in one of those situations, like the person who attacks me, I'm, I will thank them profusely before caving their head through a pavement. Like, the thing is, is, like, if they make the mistake to misconstrue my energy for weakness, that is their mistake. So that's the thing, is how I portray myself is very rigid and aggressive. Now, so many men are misconfused, like, they're, they're so misconfused, or so fucking confused, they think that you poke your chest out to be aggressive and show yourself. No, you pull your shoulders back and you prime for an attack and you tighten your chest like you're gonna rip something apart. That is aggression. So when someone looks at you like they're a predator and they're gonna victimize you, you pull your shoulders back, you roll them back and you hold and you look at them and you say, should you come at me, seek Valhalla. And that'll just fuck with their head. Because if we understand, you add a little bit of psychological warfare into it. So what we want to do is we want to say random aggressive things. But we also want to use variations in tonalities. And pretty much my whole thing is I, I usually just say, prepare to defend yourself. I'm going to fucking kill you. Because <laughs> if I'm running at you screaming that, like... Not many people want to stick around and see if I can back up my clay. So the thing is, is by going to maximum aggression, I've never had to really worry too much. You know, earlier on when I didn't understand how to defend myself and I didn't understand, you know, psychology and understand, you know, fighting and combat, you know, I used to, you know, not want to basically, you know, offend or upset that person. So I would stay in that situation. Now, I just say to them, are we fucking or fighting? Because if we're not fighting, I'm going to start fucking you, mate. And then, you know, because there's no point sitting there yapping. That's so funny, when I was down on the sunny coast, like, people reckon there was fights. All I saw was people mouthing off to each other. So many times, and I'm just like, are we throwing down? Like, I don't want to hit you if you're just talking to me. I'd feel bad. So, like, you know. But don't get me wrong. Like, I don't get out seeking violence. I was always looking for girls. I didn't really care about fighting. But, you know, should be, where, where I grew up was really violent. So I had to learn earlier 
how to really defend myself. So like, understand this, if you truly learn how to defend yourself, and truly learning how to defend yourself is learning how to kill other people, because that's the only way you can truly defend yourself. Like, yeah, yeah, you can talk big about, you know, I beat that person up. How do you know they're not going to get a, a knife or a gun or a weapon or just fucking hit you with their car? So the thing is, you know, but we don't want to just be around killing each other. Oh, I thought I heard a car. Nah, no car. But, you, you know, we don't want to do that. So the other alternative is, you know, it's sort of like this thing that whatever you focus on in life is what you seek in life. So like, you know, my childhood and growing up, I had to see like, because I had violence put on me, I had to focus on trying to avoid it. So I see violence, the potential for violence everywhere I am, which is not a bad thing. It just means that I am more sensitive in risk management when it comes to putting myself into situations where violence is. But the other thing is, is like, like I'm competent and capable. So if a, if, if a situation arises, like my only decision is just to fight until I can't. Like that's it. I'm just going to make it the most painful experience for you that, you know, to take me means to lose yourself. <laughs> so, you know, like, I'll take the joy out of you. So that's why, you know, like, naturally who I am is not a violent person. But because I wasn't, many people, many predators, tried to take advantage of that because they thought I was weak. So the only way, you know, the only way to truly, to really and truly defend your, like, stop anyone from thinking about attacking you is to be highly capable and confident. That's the only option. You can be aggressive, you can have big muscles, you know, you can puff it out, show it, you can have guns, weapons, but the only way to truly intimidate predators is if you're capable and competent because they understand and know regardless of the situation you you will remain lucid and focused on you know doing what you need to do and you have the capability to do anything that's the thing that's why like when we think of like masculinity and like you know the toughest men out there like a lot of guys will think of like, you know, like your country cowboys, like those old, you know, the old like, like dudes that wrestle bulls, you know, the dudes that have been kicked in the face that many times by bulls, they don't give a fuck. Like, whatever happens, happens. Like, I'll always tell you this, this is one of my, my things in life because I used to work in bars and things like that, and I'd always have to assess people if they were going to be dangerous on the pits. So if, if you smile at me, and I see that all your front teeth are missing, I am not going to provoke you. Because I understand you don't mind getting hit in the face. You don't mind punching on. And to this day, that judgment has never been wrong. Those are the dudes that, you know, if someone says something disrespectful to them or their girlfriend, they'll just fucking throw down. They'll just start punching. So, like, yeah. But it's, it's, it's this idea of masculinity as being, you know, like true masculinity. What, not what women think is masculine, but what men think is masculine. Is that, is that grit. It's that, it's that willingness. You know, oh, I can't get through there, it's all water. But it's that grit, it's that willingness. You know, that willingness to do or endure anything or deal with anything. 
and that's what like not not to say that like so many of us like especially us men so many of us have it still but it's like we we get made feel to feel like it's stupid or like it's you know weakness or it's toxic and it's like it's not toxic to be able to like fix a car that's not toxic like it's not toxic to be capable and confident it's toxic if i then go out and use that knowledge of how to fix a car to manipulate girls and and try and find girls in vulnerable spots like every true man knows like there's rules to all the strength and capability that you get and should you go against those rules other men will take notice and they will you know either either you know block you out from the social circle or they will deal with you how men deal with you by having a talk and then a fight and then having it dealt with so like the thing is is you know like for example like i don't consider myself tough or a, a, you know i'm just i just know in any situation i have the highest probability of likelihood if i just put all the chips on me and say fuck it whatever happens happens i'm all in and i'm willing to go through whatever it takes like if i'm willing to do that in every situation like you know that doesn't make me tough what makes me tough is when someone tries to stand over me I feel a need to not move I feel a need to stand there and not give a ground and I only move forward when people provoke me I only know forward and that's the thing like personally in my life I've always avoided fighting because like firstly I don't believe in it like I gain nothing from kicking your teeth in but the joy of kicking your teeth in like you know no girl's gonna come slap me on the ass and be woo you sexy beast you know what I mean so the thing is is you gotta like this is with me personally you just gotta understand like I avoid and abhor violence until someone does something that I feel like violence is the option and then I agree with violence so the thing is is if someone disrespects me I explain to them you have one or two choices you can apologize and we go back to being respectful or I can scale drag you outside and put your teeth through the pavement and the thing they, that many of them don't understand, but they learn, you know, because they all apologize. But the thing they learn is, I'm not joking. If I tell someone I'm going to walk over there and skull drag you out and then stomp your teeth through that fucking gutter. Like, I've said what I'm going to do. I will walk over and then I will physically grab you by the face and try and jam my hand into your face and skull drag you like i'm not joking and that's what they don't understand these betas the ones who are disrespectful because you gotta understand like men aren't disrespectful to other men unless they don't respect that man so the thing is is a man won't walk around disrespecting everyone without knowing who they are a man will give everyone respect, you know, a poser will go around and disrespect pe people and act like they have respect, but the thing is, is you, you don't disrespect random people because you don't know who can fight. That's the funniest observation I had from all my times out in bars and clubs, <laughs> like watching other blokes fight, like you could never pick it, and it was usually, you know, in some cases the small dudes got fucking obliterated but in other cases like the small dudes would fuck you up because they just didn't give a fuck and they just would hit for maximum you know 
with maximum force, whereas the bigger bloke could be taking it easy, thinking that he had it. I saw so many dudes get knocked out by, oh, bastard, by one of me mates. Because all he'd do is he'd just sit there with his hands in his pocket and then just headbutt them. <laughs> and headbutt them about three times before they hit the ground. Like, that's, like, that's the funniest thing that, like, so many people these days preach pacifism. And it's like, no, like, we've only ever dealt with and, and known how to deal with problems with violence. Now, violence isn't the option, but pacifism isn't the option as well. Because we've got to understand, should someone, should someone bring violence upon you? Like, you have to stand there and defend your right to not have violence put on you. So you have to stand there and take the blows and give them back. That's the only option. There is no other option. To try and talk your way out isn't the right option. Like, we talk our way out before it even becomes heated. Like, that's the thing. So, like, because we got to understand respect. No one's ever going to give you respect if you don't respect yourself. So if someone attacks you and you don't respect yourself enough to defend yourself, no other man's going to protect you. You know what I mean? It would be a really great, you know, sort of person that would do it, but, you know, not, not many people would. Because that's the expectation on men, is you don't get the option to not defend yourself. Like, women and children get the option to not defend themselves, but men don't. And it's very important because, like, we, we should never use our strength over another, but we should always use our strength to defend another. So that's the thing, should someone attack an innocent person near you, you attack that attacker with maximum violence. But we do not walk around seeking to put violence on others, because to do that is predatory. And to be a predator means that we are weak. For you know, to be a protector means that we go for the strongest enemy first. A predator looks for the weakest. They don't want the fight. A protector wants the fight. So, like, that's a really important thing to understand is these different types of people. And we can see where a lot of people who are in the police force, who are in the military, you know, people that... Like, like, we sort of, there are many different types of people, but there are, you know, a lot of people who are protectors and a lot of people who are predators. And it's a difference in behavior and values, but the problem is the bad predators, you know, because we got to understand, like, there's scales on everything. So, like, you know, just because someone has predatory tendencies doesn't mean that they act on them, you know? Like, just because someone might act predatory doesn't mean that they are seeking, you know, negative outcomes for other people. So, like, we've got to understand that it's important to view everything as being individual and the same if you if you sort of understand what i mean so we have to take you know if someone's acting predatory towards me i have to take their individual circumstance into it but also i have to understand how does this sit on the scale of all the other people that acted and behaved like this because if if they tick enough of the boxes I don't really need to worry it, it's sort of that's how they are so it's just understanding this difference but I hope you start to understand that like the key to self-confidence 
is just certainty. And the key to certainty is understanding that if I take certain actions, so for example, to understand like if I ever want to feel strong, like as a man, like all I have to do is, is do something selfless for another person. Like for example, if I was walking down the street and a guy was attacking a girl, if I go and defend that, defend that girl, and even if I get the shit kicked out of me, you know, it doesn't matter. Like the feeling of strength that I would have after that, you know, because it's that willingness to be able to run into the fray, to be willing to set aside your safety for another's who cannot protect themselves. Because that's what I truly believe those with strength need to do, is not use their strength against others, but use their strength for others. Because if you have strength, you have an obligation to help those who don't. For if you didn't have strength, you would hope and pray that someone with strength would help you in a time of need. So regardless, like, you know, this is a big thing that I think has been taken and stripped out of our culture and our society, is this understanding of, like, chivalry and, and knighthood, and this understanding of violence, that it's not that we should seek to be violent people, but we should seek to be violent and capable but understand how to control it at the highest level so that we can walk through the streets in, in peace and bliss while, you know, knowing that every step is safe because at any point in time, we will make it safe. So it's sort of like the warrior monk, you know, it's better to be a warrior in a monastery than a monk on a battlefield. You know, but, but to say even more, it's better to be a warrior, you know, tending the garden, who is in a, has inner peace, has calmness, has, um, you know, reached a sense of inner quietness, you know, but is also able to do the physical, able to defend themselves, able to fight able to protect and serve and yeah I think a lot in especially what I've seen in all this bullshit on social media is there's all these betas trying to tell you what an alpha is understand this the difference between a beta and an alpha is an alpha takes responsibility a beta just seeks to have all the fame and the glory and the you know, they just want the title of the alpha with none of the responsibility. And you see this in men. Some men want the titles, but they don't want the responsibility of what it truly means. You know, to lead or even to manage. And, and others are the true ones who, who, who just take up the responsibility and accept the responsibility and carry it and they help others to see that and carry the responsibility like that is an alpha in a wolf pack the alpha is the one that finds the hunting ground it's on the alpha to find the food it's on the alpha when danger comes to assess and determine what to do the alpha doesn't look you know to see what they can get the other wolves give the alpha what they need so that they can continue on. In wolf packs, the alpha doesn't lead from the front. Typically, they will lead from the back to make sure that no one is left because the alpha wouldn't leave one or it wouldn't let the pack continue on without one. A beta might because a beta doesn't accept the responsibility of what it means to lose one. It's 
So we've got to understand this, that when you seek to follow, seek to follow someone because they, they take that responsibility on. Not because they want the title. Not because they want everything that's flashy. Because the thing is, is that an alpha doesn't need to tell you that they're an alpha. You can hear it in their voice. You can hear it in their tone. You can hear it in the words they say and the actions they do. You, they do not need to tell you. And this is what's funny because when we see this in a bar fight, it's usually where someone's posing and they're usually bigger and they get their ass kicked by a smaller, quieter person. That is why, because that person was an alpha and the other person wasn't. When you're willing to take responsibility, it means you're willing to sacrifice, but also you're willing to make a decision. By being willing to make a decision, you can choose any direction you want to go. So we should always seek, especially in business I believe this, is we should seek to create our teams and our, and our companies with that in mind, that if I am the owner, if I am the leader, it is my job to put food on the table and make sure that the hunting grounds are prosperous. It's my, ta my responsibility to make sure no matter where we go, I am always the one who ensures everyone makes it. Regardless of if others leave, so if others leave others, I make sure they get there. Because I set the tempo for the team. So we gotta understand in those actions that the wolves do, the alpha is setting the, the tempo or the sort of um, the, oh, it's such a simple word, but I've forgotten that. But they're setting, they're setting the pattern of this is how we behave. This is, this is how we treat each other. This is what is acceptable. This is not what is acceptable. To the exact same that business owners and managers do that. But a lot of them create arbitrary rules and then they, you know, they, they just set targets and, and set expectations and they do nothing about it. Many of the good managers and owners, especially that I've seen in business, in many of the companies I've worked, were the ones who actively took the responsibility of, if there's a problem with leads, I have to fix that problem. I have to make sure it's fixed and it's, it's solved. You know, if there's a problem with individual workers, we sit down and we talk and we see if we can resolve the issue or if we need to part ways. Like, you know, we understand our values and we need you to uphold our values. Like, because a bad manager, especially in, in a company, is one that lets people not uphold the values of the company or the mission of the company. So for example, if their mission is to provide value and they have an employee, like let's say a sales guy, that manipulates and pressures people so he can increase his sales and increase his commissions. By a manager, even though he's making more money, by a manager keeping him there, if he's going against the values, he's only gonna erode the brand. So he's going to do more damage in the long term than, than any money he could ever bring in. So we have to understand that, that like to be a leader means you have to take the hard decision sometimes to protect the team. But it's also like you're not the one making the decisions for the team. 
you're just the one taking responsibility for the decisions of the team. So like there has to be this level, especially in, in uh, management and um, corporate and stuff like that, and bigger companies, like there has to be this trust that, hey, if I'm paying you 60 grand a year to be a salesperson and you're a competent salesperson, like there's gotta be a trust that, hey, you know how to do your job this is how we do it. I'm going to train you on how we do it. And then we're going to sort of have a two-way thing. So where you would sort of have a meeting where you would set goals and then sort of set like the time frames and then how we're going to achieve it. And then we have meetings so that as the leader, if in week two they sort of get into a bit of a slump and they're not hitting targets, we're able to revise it and you're able to give them new insights. So we got to understand that, especially, you know, when we're talking about company structures and, and we're talking about building teams, as the leader, you have to invest everything into them. It's not, you know, I'm paying you this, so you should be this. It's no, it's what do you need to get to where you want to get to and how do I give it to you? And then how do I manage that and, you know, how do I keep you on track and make sure that we're all moving towards the same goal? The highest performing teams I've worked on have all had one common thing in, in, or one thing in common. And it's not that these teams, like because I've worked across many companies and within many teams, the number one thing was is that there was clear direction and a goal. So, so we had agreement that we were moving towards a, a goal of X amount of sales for the month. This is how we were gonna do it. This is what we were in, individually responsible for. And this is what, what, we, like, what we were gonna do across the month and sort of, and then we had our, our scheduled meetings. And an important thing for this is you got to understand when you invest into someone time and energy into making them better okay your belief fuels their belief of achievement so by those companies and those managers who were really good um, investing so heavily into their teams what happened was the teams became hyper-focused and hyper-dedicated towards hitting the goals, but it was also, everyone was clear on what the result of each action was. So we knew that, you know, if we did the work, if we made the calls, if we, you know, progressed each of these uh, clients forward, it would result in sales. So everyone was cohesively moving forward. Everyone was, you know, sharing information, looking to better one another. That's the thing. The more we look to better each other by sharing what we learn and bettering ourselves, the, the faster the rate that the team will expand at or will become technically um, qualified at, I guess you could say. And... You know, it's just really important to understand that if we want to make a relationship better, any kind of relationship, the more we invest, the better it's going to be. Now, the downside to this is this is true until we get into the bullshit of society. So if people are playing bullshit games, like, you know, in business you get your fucking wheelers and dealers, they think, you know, I know boats, I'm out to get the best deal. And they're sitting there talking to 20 different people at the same time. And fucking, you know, they're not a serious buyer. So the thing is, is like, there's always going to be dickheads. There's always going to be fake people. But you just got to get better at identifying them. So every time you meet a fake person, remember either... Um, like not intellectual cues but 
th like things they say, remember the things they say and how they talk and sort of the, the perspective from which they talk in. And what we do is we save them so that whenever we meet someone who talks like that, we can instantly go, well, hey, let's keep a bit of a closer eye on this person because potentially they're gonna be, you know, this kind of a person. So, you know, it's, it's the same in relationships to, we really wanna have, oh, son of a bitch. We really wanna have like a way to mark things so that we know, you know, Statistically, if I meet 10 girls and those 10 girls have the same interests and likes and 10 out of the 10 girls uh, don't share the interests and likes with me, well then I can say that like, hey, that's, that's, uh, that, that doesn't work. Now it doesn't mean it always won't work, it just means the likelihood of it working is quite low. So we're able to create these sort of mini hypotheses of past experience and sort of create these, um, like, like create these, what would you call it? Like basically it's just these like yes, no problems. So, you know, that's what we're able to do through the past experience. But yeah, oh, it's bloody hot out here, but so nice. If you can hear the birds, I really enjoy them. Oh, but I am done for the day. So I hope you enjoyed this and have an awesome day. Thanks so much.